Hey, I'm Rob Witcher from Destination Certification, and I'm here to help you pass the CCSB exam. In this video, we'll be doing a review of the central topics in cost benefit analysis evaluation criteria in domain one. It will help you in your studies by showing you how each of these topics interrelate. This is the fifth of five videos for domain one. I've included links to the other mind map videos in the description below. These mind maps are just a fraction of our complete CCSP masterclass. As I highlighted in the previous mind map video, moving to cloud is very much a business decision. We are now going to walk through a few cost benefit analysis pieces that are important for the business to consider when deciding whether to move to the cloud or not. Pay per usage refers to the fact that cloud services follow a consumption based pricing model where users pay only for the resources they consume. For example, computing, storage, network bandwidth, etc. This can potentially offer consumers some nice cost efficiencies by eliminating the need for upfront investment and a lot of hardware and systems. CapEx to OpEx highlights that moving to the cloud shifts capital expenditures, CapEx, like purchasing hardware and software to operational expenditures, OpEx, which are ongoing expenses for using cloud services. This can improve cash flow management and flexibility. So instead of organizations having to pay a bunch of money upfront, capital expenditures, and then amortizing those costs over time, they can just pay for whatever cloud services they use each month, OPEX. Depreciation. In traditional on-premise setups, hardware depreciates over time and must be replaced. Cloud computing reduces the need for such capital investments as cloud providers handle infrastructure upgrades. So if an organization remove everything to the public cloud, it wouldn't have to think about depreciation at all anymore. Of course, if an organization builds its own in-house private cloud with its own hardware, then depreciation is still an important consideration. Next, data center and utility costs. Public cloud services eliminate the need for maintaining physical data centers, reducing costs for electricity, cooling, and space, as the cloud provider absorbs these instead. So again, moving everything to the public cloud, and now an organization doesn't have to pay tons of data center and utility costs if they've moved everything to the cloud. They'll just have a hefty monthly bill for their cloud service provider. Resource pooling. Cloud providers take advantage of resource pooling in which their customers share computing resources like storage and network capacity, reducing per user costs and increasing efficiency. This can potentially, potentially make the cloud core resources of compute network and storage cheaper in the cloud. Software licensing. Traditional software licensing often requires large upfront costs where cloud-based services typically follow a subscription model, allowing organizations to scale and pay for only what they need. Watch out though, as software licensing costs in the cloud can be very different from licensing costs on-premise for the same software. I've actually worked with a few organizations that faced significantly higher licensing costs when they lifted and shifted systems into the cloud. So just something to watch out for. Personnel and operational costs. Moving to the cloud certainly reduces the need for large in-house IT teams to manage infrastructure as cloud providers handle maintenance, updates, and security. This can result in major reductions in personnel and operational costs for an organization. But watch out, it's a terrible idea to fire all of your in-house subject matter experts if you move to the cloud. This is a problem that has existed with outsourcing for decades. If you outsource a bunch of stuff and then fire all of your in-house staff, you lose all of your organizational expertise and you have no one left who can keep an eye on your service provider and challenge them. You have no one to ensure the service providers is providing good services at a reasonable price. So any organization may end up paying more for their service provider for a lower level of service than they used to have in-house. The final one is shift in focus. By moving to the cloud, companies can shift their focus from managing infrastructure to strategic business functions and innovation, potentially increasing productivity and growth. So moving systems to the cloud and letting the cloud provider take care of those systems can allow an organization to focus more on its core business, which could be beneficial. All right, let's now move on to evaluation criteria, which are independent objective evaluation systems for products. Here's how this works. A vendor will create a product and then the vendor will pay an independent testing lab, 
to evaluate their product using one of the evaluation criteria we'll discuss in just a moment. The independent lab will test the product, give it a rating, and produce a report that the vendor can then hand out to their customers. Customers are going to trust the rating in the report because it was provided by an independent testing lab, not the vendor. There are two major steps involved in the evaluation criteria. The first is certification, and the second is accreditation. We'll start with certification, which is the comprehensive technical analysis of a solution or product to ensure it meets our needs. In other words, the certification step is where the independent testing lab evaluates a product and gives it a rating. Let's start with the most commonly used evaluation criteria in the world, the aptly named Kraman Criteria for Information Technology Security Evaluation. Everyone just calls it common criteria. It can be used to evaluate all sorts of different devices. After a product has been evaluated using common criteria, it will be given an evaluation assurance level rating, an EAL rating between one and seven. An EAL rating of seven is the highest and indicates the most secure, and an EAL rating of one is the lowest. Now let's talk about another evaluation criteria you need to know about, FIPS, the Federal Information Processing Standard 140-3. Unlike the common criteria, which can be used to evaluate anything, FIPS 140-3 is focused on evaluating cryptographic modules like TPMs and HSMs, Trusted Platform Modules and Hardware Security Modules. We'll talk about them more in the fifth mind map video of Domain 4, link in the description below. FIPS defines four levels. Level 1 is the lowest level and it imposes limited requirements. Components must only be production ready. Level two adds requirements for physical tamper, evidence and role-based authentication. Level three adds tamper resistance and identity-based authentication. Finally, level four adds robustness against environmental attacks. You don't need to memorize all those details, but that's kind of the major differences. Here's a table that nicely summarizes the four FIPS levels. This is an important thing to remember. Remember the physical security requirements are level two and above. Now the final part of evaluation criteria, accreditation. As I discussed, the whole point of evaluation criteria is to help an organization evaluate and compare different products and choose the best solution for their organization. The final step therefore in selecting a product is to get management's approval for them to sign off. This is accreditation. It's the official management sign off for a set period of time to purchase and deploy a product in the organization. You essentially need accreditation. You need management saying, we approve this device to be used in the organization. And there you go. That's an overview of cost benefit analysis and evaluation criteria within domain one. We've covered most of the critical concepts or the key critical concepts you need to know for the exam.